Um, so Vincent, can you tell us about yourself and how you got into machine learning? Well, I did. Uh, I was always interested in uh, mathematics, and uh, I did a PhD in statistics. Actually, it was uh, computational statistics. That's what it was called back then. But it was, you know, it was kind of data science already in uh, machine learning. I worked a lot in uh, uh, image processing. Um, and after my PhD, I moved uh, to Cambridge University in UK, uh, doing a postdoc at the Stat Labs. And after that, uh, I thought I was going to become a university professor. Didn't end up that way. I uh, got job offers in the internet and uh, so started working for internet companies, uh, CNET, NBC, I, which is the, they, they wanted to start a uh, internet version of NBC. Uh, then um, worked with uh, uh, companies in uh, uh, finance as well, like uh, Visa, uh, Wells Fargo. Um, and I uh, came back to the internet working on uh, fraud detection, botnet detection, uh, keyword scoring, um, you know, that, that sort of thing. So initially with uh, Infospace, then I raised uh, uh, VC funding for company I started uh, around 2006, uh, Authentic Click, which was about click scoring. And at the same time, I created uh, Analytic Bridge, which was the parent company of Data Science Central, a large community for you know, machine learning uh, practitioners. It was acquired in 2020 by uh, Tech Target. And um, so after that, I uh, started uh, mltechniques.com where I publish uh, uh, my new uh, material, which are books, uh, articles, and uh, starting uh, courses actually on, uh, on the subject. So that's pretty much uh, summarized my career path. Yeah, that's great. And like, uh, great that you mentioned ML techniques, because a lot of uh, what you like publish about uh, actually ended up on your, your most recent book. Do you want to speak a bit about that? Because the course is also based off of that book as well. Uh, yeah, so um, I wrote a previous book. Uh, so I've been writing a, a number of books, actually. But uh, recently, in the last year, I started to uh, Publish much higher quality books in in LaTeX with glossaries, index, clickable links, uh, and so forth. So the previous one in December, January, uh, was with about uh, stochastic processes and the simulations. It's a little bit more uh, special uh, specialized, um, but the most recent one it's uh, intuitive machine learnings and it's uh, it really summarize a lot of what I've been doing in the corporate world, research, uh, this really state-of-the-art uh, new uh, research topics discussed, but in such a way that it's really very uh, applied and to make the things uh, a lot uh, easier. Like for instance, in, in chapter one, I talk about regression, but I introduce a, a kind of a general unified approach to regression. And as I say, why learn 50 different types of regression when you have one that can do everything and even more? Um, if you look at one of these articles actually available for free on mltechniques.com, it's about the, the cloud regression. It's not regression done in the cloud, but it's considering the uh, your data set as a cloud of points. So they, there's not really a response or predictors. It's all blurred to you. Um, I call it sometimes unsupervised regression, actually. So, so you know that in the machine learning, you have supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Uh, I've also included a lot of uh, um, recent um, work that I've been doing, for instance, in a shape recognition. That's related to computer vision. Talking about computer visions, the book and the course will also contain a uh, you know, significant part that's related to uh, visualization and introducing uh, new, new ways to visualize the data, which essentially is video, data, uh, video, by data, video. I'm not talking about me talking about data in a video, but uh, uh, you, you can add some uh, examples uh, in, you know, in uh, when uh, this interview get uh, posted, you might have seen them. Um, 
but one, one of them, for instance, is about curve fitting, which is a generalization of uh, linear regression. And you see hundreds of uh, data set being fitted uh, against various uh, ellipses. So in, in like 20 or 30 seconds, you can summarize a tremendous amount of uh, information to see how um, you know, a particular technique uh, works. A lot of the things I've been doing recently, and actually it dates back to my PhD, because I was already doing that like 30 years ago or something. Uh, it was not called synthetic data back then, but it's you know, now it's called uh, synthetic data. It was called uh, simulation. So, you know, so it's going to be including, uh, as well as in the course, you know, generative models, uh, how to test uh, black box, improve uh, predictions using synthetic data. For instance, if you blend uh, synthetic data with real data, it's called uh, augmented data. So I'll talk about that as well. And uh, another important part is uh, explainable AI, uh, in, uh, interpretable uh, machine learnings. Um, it's become uh, very popular uh, these days. So there, there's been problems in the past with uh, black box that behave in totally unexpected ways. Uh, there was a stock market crash and one day the uh, uh, Dow Jones fell by a thousand or 2000 points suddenly and then came back up the next day. And apparently these were algorithms playing against each order and out of control on the loose in the wild. <laughs> Nobody knows what, what happened, but um, you want to avoid that, especially if you're going to sell solutions to you know, corporate uh, clients. I mean, if you do the, the stuff for, for yourself, like there was a, a hedge fund renaissance, I think that was the name, it was, they were incredibly successful. It was actually on the, also on Wall Street, but doing those, and they were using those black boxes that were doing trades. They, were, they had no idea the, kind of awkward trades that the, the algorithm was doing, was losing money, was making money, on average, it did incredibly well. If you do that for yourself, then maybe that's fine, but once you are you share this with some other people, and it, sometimes it can crash in unexpected ways, like it did you know, on, on Wall Street. Another important issue with um, those black box uh, models, I've heard the terms white box actually uh, recently, which is kind of the opposite of a, uh, a black box, which is explainable. So the, these black box algorithms, they, they make, you know, sometimes decision, uh, for instance, if, you, if you're looking for uh, a loan and you, you know, you go to a lender, a bank or something, like, and they use those algorithm, you get rejected and they cannot explain why. Nobody has any idea why you, on average, maybe it works well, but this has uh, created a lot of problems. And uh, I, I believe at this point in the United States, it's, uh, it's illegal actually to use a system like that without providing any explanations why someone gets uh, uh, rejected. It might include biases uh, within the algorithm that nobody is aware of. Uh, and that could result in penalizing uh, possibly minorities or some other people that uh, even if it's kind of an automated system, in the end, it's been designed by human beings and the bias might still be there in, in, in the algorithm. So that's one of the problems with those black boxes. It's also much easier to sell um, a black box if it's explainable, if you want to convince uh, stakeholders and show how it works and stuff like that and uh, show that they are not going to be anything unexpected out of control. It's much easier to sell a solution that's uh, explainable. And the loss in um, quality in the predictions, the loss of predictive power might not be that great. You hear stories about, for instance, uh, Google or Microsoft with neural networks with uh, one trillion parameters. They, they've been bragging a lot about about that. And, and my question is how much more you get from a totally unexplainable system of one trillion parameters versus one billion, uh, for instance. So that's something um, you know that's, uh, you need to uh, think about. Um, so what was your question again? 
Yeah, I think I think it's fine. Like you, you actually started answering other questions that I had, like uh, you know, like uh, like the fact that your course covers the concept of explainable AI. Like, why is it important for models to be explainable? Um, so you've answered that already. But maybe I can ask another one, which is like, what is like, what are some important business problems that your course can help participants uh, solve? Yeah, there are a few uh, business problems that I've included in uh, in the in the book, and also is going to be in the in the training as well. Um, one of them is with uh, natural language processing (NLP). Um, you're going to learn how to crawl the web in the, really in a professional enterprise kind of uh, fashion, like you know crawling uh, billions of pages over a period of many months and uh, resuming the crawler when it crashes and it's uh, done in a distributed architecture. So I'm going to explain uh, how to do uh, those things. Also, uh, one of the important uh, problems to be uh, solved is creation, uh, creating uh, taxonomies, uh, like uh, keyword taxonomies or if you're product taxonomies, you want to classify which is essentially text unstructured data into uh, structured data with you know categories, subcategories, and stuff like that. So this is an important um, you know, business problem, and uh, I've been working on uh, on that for for quite some time. Uh, when I was at eBay, for instance, um, keyword classification was one of the they were purchasing like 10 million uh, keywords on Google on a daily basis, and you had to kind of categorize those uh, keywords, especially those with very little history that represent the, the fat tail um, to, to assess how much you want to bid on these uh, uh, keywords. Uh, so that's, that's an example. Um, the, uh, I also discuss uh, some of the example that's uh, related to uh, marketing mix uh, optimization. Like for instance, when I was at uh, NBC, they were trying to uh, start an internet, they were called a portal, internet portal, which is kind of a directory with subdirectories of uh, you know, all the information you can get from on the internet. And they were using uh, TV shows, like they were they had 20 TV shows, about 10 of them were running every week to promote uh, the, the website in question. And what they asked me is which of those TV, which of these TV shows are doing uh, best, which ones are not doing great in order to kind of optimize how they um, spend their money on those, you know, um, advertising channels. Uh, so it's re-advertising mix optimization. And it's in a context where A-B testing is not, it's not really uh, possible due to inventory. You, I, you don't really have, the option to oh we're going to test uh, this and this and that no it's it was available you see what's what's there and and you have to deal with it and find what works uh, best or not and in the future when you know it's really launched and you have more options to decide we're going to reduce i mean for instance uh low and order was uh, was doing great you can inc increase you know the the budget on, on that tv show and decrease on some uh, some other tv show uh, that that's another uh, example i also discuss uh, in details, um, decision tree, boosted trees. I introduced actually uh, something that's um, a simplified version of this as well. And uh, this is used a lot, uh, for instance, in fraud detection. Um, so, and I have a lot, lot of background in fraud detection. So definitely there's going to be something about that too in, in the course. Great. Um, and so like one, one thing that like, there's, there's definitely a lot of courses on the internet. Um, and, uh, there's this course, which I definitely think a lot of people can benefit from, um, but it's better for them to hear from you directly. So what is unique about your course that, um, participants can find elsewhere? Well, there are a few different things, uh, probably one stemming from the way I learn myself. I'm a, a self-learner. I want to get to the point uh, very quickly when I buy, buy a book and when I listen to some of the courses, it, it takes really a lot of time, hours for to explain 
something uh, extremely general. So I want to, you know, in a, a short amount of time as possible, bring uh, the students to the core of the topics, get them work on you know, what I call enterprise grade uh, projects. Um, there's also a component uh, which is going to be Python. So uh, I'm going to be using uh, Python, but I want the students to uh, learn from code that I've already written or that's, that, that's available so they can quickly uh, write real professional uh, code. In some classes, you're going to see they use Jupyter notebooks and stuff like that. They use a lot of uh, function in the libraries for supervised classification or whatever, uh, but they don't really, they, they kind of use it a little bit like a, a black box. So I want to the, the students to get a better understanding of them, how the, those works, the, the limitations, how to uh, improve them so that you know, you're, not, you're not running something and violating the, the assumptions of those functions and end up with something, uh, some results. And I have examples, for instance, of uh, you know code that uh, it does kind of work, actually, it produces results uh, that that kind of meaningful to some extent, but they're very poor quality because they, there's numerical instability. So that's also one of the focus. And, and you might not notice it, you might not know because you, you get results. They're not necessarily bad, but you could get a lot more better if you understand what works and switch from one uh, library function in Python that's doing curve fitting to swarm optimization in the problems like, where there are a lot of multiple maxima and minima, uh, you're going to get some instability. And so how are you going to, to deal with that? So that's something I, I, I will also explain in the in course. Uh, other than that, uh, what's also original, I, I guess the, the, my background is also uh, you know, fairly different. I've been working with companies like uh, uh, NBC, Microsoft, Visa, Wells Fargo, eBay, lots of startups. I raised uh, VC money. I created a, a large community, uh, Data Science Central, that I you know, self-funded um, and eventually sold to a publicly traded uh, company, uh, Tech Target. So the, the, the students, if they are interested, can you know, interact with me and, and learn how to um, or get advice if they are ever interested in, in uh, doing something like that. At the very least, they should be interested. And th that's also one point I want to emphasize in creating a uh, great network on LinkedIn, how to you know, uh, become a much more well-known so that in the end, jobs are coming to you as opposed to you always searching for, for new jobs. So how do I design a nice, GitHub uh, repository, I do, I promote that. So this is an important uh, component, uh, component of the of the course. Sounds great. Um, so thinking about the future of machine learning, um, what are some of the things that excite you at the moment? Well, synthetic data, of course, because I, I, I started with, with that long, long ago and it's becoming uh, Really popular and more, um, you know, more complicated. More we work with a much, much, much bigger data set. How to generate sound uh, synthetic data that makes sense? That how to test it? Like to make sure it's rich enough. And how, how do you see it has value? So how do you test, how, how do you blend that with uh, uh, real data and get better predictions? Um, and, in a nutshell, the way you're going to get uh, better predictions because synthetic data can generate a lot of different uh, data points that you don't observe. Like, let's say you you have uh, sixty thousand pictures, and each picture represents a digit, so a handwritten uh, digit. You you use this to uh, character recognition, automated character recognitions. Now, if you include synthetic data, you might have digits written in a way that are unexpected that you're not going to find in your uh, data set. So in the future, because you have incorporated that synthetic data into your real data, when faced with some unusual handwritten characters, you, you have a richer uh, data set that you've been doing your, your test on and you uh, use for, for validation uh, purposes. 
So yeah, synthetic data is uh, one example. Um, comes also with uh, gener generative models, uh, mixture models. You probably have, uh, that term is very popular uh, right now. Something uh, quite hot. Um, causality is another hot topic these days. Um, everybody has heard time and over causality, uh, correlation is not uh, causation. Uh, but there's a, a tendency to try to uh, build models. They not really per se detect the causes, but you can uh, you can tell the model these are hundreds of potential causes, which which are causes and which are not causes, which are correlations. So, uh, for instance, hierarchical Bayesian models have been used for uh, that kind of stuff. And like I said, explainable AI, I like to call it human-friendly AI or human-friendly uh, black boxes is a, is a very hot topic right now. Uh, and something I also uh, think is important uh, and so certainly moving forward is how to automate exploratory data analysis, how to automate uh, data cleaning. You hear a lot of time, from data scientists, I spend 80% of my time cleaning data. I, I think it should be 5%, but, but that's just me, but maybe we'll get to that point one day. But imagine if companies hiring and, and paying, I don't know, $200,000 a year to a data scientist, and, and suddenly, you know, 80% of what he's doing gets automated. Well, anyway, just saying. So uh, these are things that uh, excite me. Nice. It's a, that's a, that's a huge problem. Like uh, the, the machine learning engineers and data scientists in general, they get like really yeah. frustrated with having to spend most of their time like cleaning data. And we call it feature engineering, but at the, at the end of the day, it's like hygiene that should be handled um, and fully automated at some point. Yeah, I think the problem um, is that a lot of people who do that, they kind of uh, young, uh, must, they, they tend to be younger people, so that uh, a little bit less of experience. The, the people, uh, top people who might be older, might have no clue how this can be automated. And the younger people, because they've not been exposed to tons and tons of data set, each time they see a new data set, it's, it's a new set of issues, it's a new set of problems. And yes, there are many, but there they, they are dozens of issues, but they're not hundreds, they're not thousands. And uh, so, and, and I discussed those those issues and I'm not saying you're going to totally automate data cleaning, but if you can, to a large extent, automate it, that would be a you know, fantastic uh, step forward. Yeah, that sounds great. And I guess maybe like, the, just like a last question, if you have anything to add, like, is there anything else you would like to say to your future students? Uh, an important part, and I was also uh, uh, going to be stressing on that in the, in the course, is uh, learning how to learn, uh, which is even more important probably than learning some actual uh, material. Like, for instance, when um, we're going to do some uh, Python code, um, I'm going to explain to, to students. Um, but let's give an example. You want to create a soundtrack. In Python, um, you, you want not only to create video about your data, but you want also to create sound. And maybe you think that if you listen to the, the sound that your data is making, you're going to get some, your brain is going to pick up some signals that you, you don't see visually with your, with your eyes. So how do I start for a project like that uh, from scratch? And I want the students, of course, I have a solution, I'll show them, but I want the students to be able to themselves with some guidance, say, look on a Stack Exchange, on some LinkedIn groups, ask questions, read stuff about that. There are some, some code is posted somewhere. How do, I, how do I manage to be independent and, and start designing something myself on, on my own without needing, you know, for free actually, and that's how I, I did it actually. And you have to pay an expensive books or trainings or uh, for that. And that's just one of an, an example. Uh, like for instance, I, I may mention in the course, uh, Swarm optimization would fix that sort of uh, optimization problem. I might not go into the detail of Swarm optimization itself. I may say, well, 
do a search on Google, Python and Swarm optimization, the first thing you're going to find is a library actually that just does that. Then learn the details about what it does, get the code, and, and that's how you get uh, started. And also to avoid you know, reinventing the wheel because you need to be careful about what exists and not try to, to, to reinvent the wheel. But I will guide the, the students with that. Um, uh, some of the things that I'm uh, thinking about, um, some advice for the students was to, to, to build the network, uh, for instance, the LinkedIn network, the portfolio, uh, you know, post the projects that they've been working on, a, a GitHub uh, repository, and I will help with that. Uh, those who are interested, uh, I can also explain um, how to produce very high quality PDF documents uh, that will look great on them when they share with you know, potential uh, employers. Um, so helping the students with getting a job uh, is also is going to be an important part. I say that I so those who successfully complete the, the projects, I'm ready to you know, offer them a, a LinkedIn endorsement. So many things that helps with um, the, the, the students, um, as long as they, you know, they work on the project successfully, which I'm here to help. Mm -hmm.